We've been talking about grace for the battle. We've been working our way through Ephesians. We took a little break for Christmas. Now we're finishing up this series of sermons, and we've been going through the individual pieces of armor. And today, we're going to talk about being head-to-toe ready, because we're going to be talking about feet that are readied with the gospel of peace. Oh, I forgot to mention, children at this time are dismissed for Children's Church. I'm always afraid I'm going to forget something. There is what I forgot this morning. So, Thanks, Ben, for uh, the wave there. We're going to talk about having our feet readied with the gospel of peace, what, what that means. We're going to talk about have, putting on the helmet of salvation. If you're going to battle, you're, your feet matter, don't they? Your footing matters. It matters because you don't want to be slipping around when you're trying to fight a battle. It's really important. We see that. You know how much time is spent in the world of athletics trying to get good shoes and cleats so that people don't slip. I was uh, going to bring some broom ball shoes. How many people here have ever played broom ball? About two people from Minnesota. When I was from Minnesota, we played, played broom ball. I was uh, born and raised in California, so it wasn't a, a game that we played in California. This is a game, basically, you, you play it in the hockey rink with shoes on instead of ice skates, and, and you have, it used to be a broom, now they kind of, it's kind of like plastic end of this uh, broom-like, um, what would we call that, uh, stick, right? And you hit a little teeny soccer ball and you try to put it in a net and you run around. And, um, and so if, if anybody knows anything about me, if, if there's any game you can play sports-wise, I'll probably do it because I think it's fun, right? So I got out there, these guys got me into playing broom ball and we played in college and then... There was a city league. We decided we were going to play broom ball in the city league, which was brutal. Um, I do have caps in the front of my um, mouth from a, a broom ball stick to the face, but that's another story for, for another day. But when we played at college, we, we just wore our tennis shoes out on the ice. That's We'd just run around with our tennis shoes, and you'd kind of slide and shoot, shoot the ball, and we got in this league, and everybody had these broom ball shoes, but for us. So uh, about the fourth week of being passed by by somebody, um, I decided maybe a change in, in shoes would be in order. For a while, we tried to make them ourselves because we were cheap and we didn't want to buy them and we were in college. That didn't go so well. They fell apart. Eventually, we got broom ball shoes, and I was going to bring them, but I, I, I couldn't find them in the move. But they got a little cushy bottom. Uh, the next week, when we, when we changed in the first half, I think I had two goals because all of a sudden I could move and not slide the same way. The, the point of all of that is our footing matters. If you lose your footing, you're in danger. When my uh, children rounding the bases one time uh, fell down, and one of the things I saw the next week is uh, changed which shoes and cleats they wore. When it comes to spiritual battle in the time of the writing of of this letter to to the church in Ephesus, it mattered to the Roman soldier his footing. He didn't want to be slipping around and sliding around. And so when we read today's passage, we're going to hear a little bit about this Reading your feet with a gospel of peace. Now, this, the interesting thing is, David Ferguson just read an, wrote an article in Outreach, and he's quoting some Berna statistics. He says that evangelizing, currently it seems that evangelism is taboo, and the word is taboo, and evangelizing often comes across as culturally inappropriate. According to Berna's research, nearly half of millennials practicing Christians, so millennials who are practicing Christianity, say it's wrong to evangelize. 
it shocking to you? 47% say it's wrong to do. But at the same time, Christians still recognize that evangelism was essential to Jesus' message and mission. Two out of three millennial who are practicing Christianity believe being a witness about Jesus is part of the faith. That's at about 66%. The embrace of contradictory statements creates confusion about evangelism that results in church just developing a lackluster approach to reaching the lost. Maybe you feel that. He goes on to say, Scripture shows that while evangelism may appear to be a lost cause, God's commitment to evangelism is relentless, ultimate, and ongoing. Part of the spiritual battle is sharing our faith. Perhaps it's just the word evangelism that people don't understand. People have this idea of, of somebody who's um, kind of rude and in your face, you know, um, maybe that's it. And I think, well, witnessing is just a nicer way of doing it. I suggest to you that our lack of evangelism among people who attend church is something that we need to take serious and get at the root of because we are called to not only embrace the gospel of peace ourselves and be, and, and be preaching it ourselves, but also to be sharing it with others. And I think what we are really passionate about, we will share. So these terms, some of them, we're going to unpack today. What does it mean when we talk about the gospel? What does it mean when we talk about uh, salvation? What I'd like to do is walk us through, at first what I would like to walk us through is Ephesians. So if you've got your Bibles, you turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to reread this passage we've been reading. We're going to remind ourselves what we've been learning, and we're going to move forward in the Word of God today. Will you pray with me one more time that the Lord would show you wonderful things in His Word? Let's pray those words. Lord, Lord, show me wonderful things in Your Word and help me apply it. Remove things that dis- would distract me. Help me to focus on what you would want to say to me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Finally, be strong in the Lord. This this is not a time for wimpy Christianity. Therefore, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So where does the power come from? And finally means, in conclusion, what we've seen in, in this letter to the church of Ephesus by the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. So don't just put part of it on, put it all on, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. There there are folks who say, you know, I, I don't really believe in evil spirits, I don't really believe in the devil, I don't really believe in those things, but they are a reality, and and they are something we need to be aware of. There's caricatures of them sometimes. We're not talking about a devil who wears red pajamas and carries a pitchfork, right? But there, there, there are real enemies of our soul against the schemes of the devil For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, battling in the spiritual realm. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. As you see the days you're in, we shouldn't just have this man tell you, you know, we're just going to keep passive until the Lord returns and we're not going to really worry about it. We're called to be strong. The strength we get is from the Lord. So it's, it's not only our own, it's not in our own strength. It's in his strength that we stand. It's in his strength that we fight. We're also not called to be passive. We're supposed to put on these armors. We're supposed to be strong in the Lord. 
Faith leads to action, not inactivity. The Holy Spirit does not excuse laziness, but empowers life transformation and change. Amen? That you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And you go back, we've, we've talked about that in past weeks. And having putting, put on the breastplate of righteousness... And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. The good news. Gospel means good news. Of peace. It means we have peace with God. Peace with our ultimate purpose in life. Peace within ourselves. And peace with all of those who are. um, Children of God. It doesn't guarantee everyone will have peace with us because the Scripture says what? As, as much as you're able to live in peace with folks. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit With all prayer and supplication to that end, keep, what's the word there? Alert. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Just going to ask you, how often are you praying uh, for others' spiritual safety? How often are you praying for other believers? And also for me, and also for me, the the new role I'm stepping into of of directing church strengthening for our district, one of the things that I have been noticing is that we, we can have a tendency at churches to criticize people who are leading or teaching or whatever and not spend time praying for them. Even pastors in another church, and we get competitive. And instead of praying for them and praying that God will give them boldness and clarity and wisdom, we can just be critical. We can be critical with one another instead of praying for one another. There's times we have to speak truth into people's life and, and, and give them maybe some feedback they don't want to hear, but it should always be done in a well-intentioned way. And it should never be done until we've prayed for them. And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth, bully to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So when you, when you hear a, a pastor or someone and you say, well, that message seems to be compromising truth. It doesn't sound like he was as bold as he should have been. I pray that we'll pray for them. And... Um, speak for them. And when we hear a pastor or a leader or, or somebody in their family or a different spots saying the right things, we would also pray for them. They, we will continue to, to do that. I remind you that these themes, that God would provide a way of salvation for us and empower us, go all the way back to the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 14 and through 17. It says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away, for truth is stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Think about that, whether we're living through, right? People don't know the truth, and when you try to tell them the truth, um, you become prey, it says. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him, and there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and he wrapped himself in a real cloak. These messages, one of the things over the last years of my life I've, I've noticed is that we have a... We, all, as George Werber said many years ago, and you've heard me say zillions of times, we're all educated beyond our obedience level. 
And so oftentimes we come and we talk about things like today's sub subject, and we say, ah, I've heard some of that stuff before. The question isn't what we've heard, but how do we apply it? So what we're really concentrating, the piece of armor we're talking today about is first, put on shoes for your feet, the readiness of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? I believe this means both the mobility that comes from knowing the gospel of peace and the protection that comes from actively sharing the gospel with others. Part of your spirituality is not only to know the gospel, one of the things that has been said and I think is really good for our own spiritual soul care is not to listen to ourselves but to preach the gospel to ourselves. Does that make sense? Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say that. And sometimes we get these thoughts that lead Make sure that we are centering ourselves on the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that you and I were created by God. And that we're created with a purpose. And that purpose is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our mind. We're created to worship God and to live in harmony with one another. And so Jesus said the two greatest commandments was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. We're created to live in harmony with God and worship him and to live in harmony with one another and serve one another in love. And we mess up. We dishonor God with our lives. And we're not as kind as we should be with one another. And so we needed a savior to set us free from our sins, from the very evil things that we think and do. So Christ came, being fully God and fully man, and died to pay for all of those sins and to give us his righteousness, right? So that there would be peace between us and God, and ultimately between peace, peace between us and other people, and we would live in a new heaven and a new earth where there would be no dying or death or weeping, and that is coming. That kingdom is coming. Praise the Lord. It has arrived, and it is coming. Um, the blessed Already not yet. The gospel of peace, the next thing, quote I want to give you from MacArthur's commentary is this, the gospel of peace is the marvelous truth that in Christ we are now peace with God and are one with him. Therefore, when our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, we stand in the confidence of God's love for us, his union with us, and his commitment to fight for us. This, this word, gospel, it occurs 93 times in the New Testament. It's good news. It's the good news that Jesus loves us, that our sins can be forgiven, that his Holy Spirit comes to fill us. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, he says this, now I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. You know, I, I say oftentimes, you've heard it zillions of times, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Now, now you say, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to, to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to an one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, this is Paul writing, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them through it. 
It was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. So it was not I, but it was the grace that was working in me. That's, that's, that's the gospel. It changes lives. There's content to it. It's not just whatever you want it to be. It's the fact that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, rose again, ascended into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit to fill his people, and will return. In Romans, Paul writes this. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. he says that I, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the, to the Greek. We did a whole series, we preached a whole sermon series when it's here through Romans about this whole idea of not ashamed. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We're, we're delighting in this truth that there is good news. There is hope that goes beyond the grave. There's light for a dark world. One of the things, and you've heard me say this, but one of the things that really came to me as I was reading through this passage is how important it is to to do two things with the gospel. One, to apply it to our own lives. So there's peace in our soul that we know, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. I'm secure in the hands of the Lord. He's already in Ephesians say, told them that they were chosen by God, that they were redeemed by the Son, and that they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, which is a guarantor of what is to come. Praise the Lord. So it, you're not going to be able to be victorious in spiritual battles, you're not going to, to do the good works which God prepared beforehand that you should do if you don't understand and you have not experienced the gospel yourself. This is both for those, those who don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You, you cannot win a spiritual battle. You're on a road to destruction. There's not hope for you apart from Christ, so you need to put your faith in Christ. And it's also for us who have, who have made a profession of faith. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. It's something that's just not for way back in your past. It's something that we need to remind ourselves every day when the, when the accuser, the devil says, you're a loser. And the devil says, I'm, gonna, I'm going to make your identity the sin you struggle with or the temptation you struggle with. It's going to say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. Amen? For many years, I, I did a Bible study in jail, and when folks go to AA, they always knew that they'd been talking to me because I, I didn't like folks making identity statements like, I am an alcoholic, but rather to say, I'm a child of God, <laughs> bought by the blood of Christ, who still at times struggles with. Isn't that true? You guys still struggle with temptations? You still have some destructive desires in your life that would drive you to places you shouldn't go? Of course. But they're not our identity. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction and say you need to do it differently. But never condemnation because in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1 says there is no condemnation. We talk week in and week out about what happens when Christians find their identity in something other than Christ. The gospel of peace comes to me because I know that nothing, nothing can change my identity. I'm a child of God through faith in Christ. And nothing can change my destiny. He who began a good work in me will bring it to its day of completion. He will deliver me safely from every evil attack. 
That confidence gives us the footing we need for the spiritual battle we're called to fight. They call it stinking thinking in recovery. As soon as somebody starts going, I'm no good, I'm just a terrible drunk, I'm a terrible, and getting the self-pity party, what happens? They go back to the drinking. And it doesn't matter what sin it is. We all, we all have a temptation to get into self-pity and then to get out of self-pity to indulge in the same old sins over and over again. Second thing I noticed in, in recovery is the folks that do the best in recovery are those who are helping others recover. <laughs> because as they, share, as they share about how, how they've been delivered and are being delivered, it strengthens their own recovery. And the things I love uh, here in doing biblical counseling is like our Pick Me Up Monday group, helping people who struggle with being down over grieving different things and hard times in life. Because it's so good for me to be a part of that group. Or when I'm in groups and we're talking about, it doesn't matter if it's with a group of folks struggling with pornography or a group of people struggling with drug or alcohol things, or a, people, a group of people struggling with lying. It doesn't matter what, what it is. It, you can find hope in the gospel, and we find hope in fellowship with one another. Amen? But folks who say, you know, I'm just, I'm not interested in investing in anybody else. I'm just interested in getting my own salvation. It's just not scriptural. To say, you know what? You know, the world's getting really evil. I hope Jesus comes back soon. I think we can all be glad when the Lord returns. But the reason I'm excited for the Lord's return because he's told us that he's not slow, but he's waiting. He knows who's going to come in and repent, right? Because he didn't, doesn't wish for any to perish. Because any of those he knows are coming. And so it's right for Christians to, to want the Lord to return, but it's wrong to have an attitude that says basically to hell with the rest of the world as long as, long as I'm out of here. God didn't place you where you are right now. So you could just... Shelter yourself from the problems and people around you. He puts you where you are if you're a follower of Jesus so you could bring hope into hopeless situations. He puts you in dark places so you could be light in a dark world. That's why you're there. You say, well, I'd prefer not to be here. You know, the Lord said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Sometimes it's, we need to have our hearts broken, right? I didn't care about a lot of prison reform until for 14 years I went to jail, and then all of a sudden I'm concerned about people I know. It's not a joke to me to think about people being sexually assaulted in a prison system. As we change over insurance, it's, it's amazing how I'm much more concerned now about the cost of needed medicine. Whatever rocky places we're on, God didn't put us there by accident. He's doing stuff. You want to be ready for the spiritual battle, you, you'll realize that the most important message in the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ because it brings hope to, in other words, hopeless world. That's why people ask, what, what is your church about? What, is it, what problem are you trying to solve? It's easy. We're trying to solve the problem of hopelessness. We have a class here on Wednesday night, in discipleship and helping people share their faith and be a disciple of Christ. It's all, all part of that. You can't be a disciple of Jesus and never share your faith with anyone else. The Great Commission was given to his church, go and make disciples of the nations. 
we need to be awakened. A lot of families go to church every Sunday, but they're not discipling even their own children. They got so busy that they're just dropping their kids off at a, at a bus stop, sending them off to a school that's going to teach them things that are contradictory to the teachings of Christ, and then picking them up, and then maybe driving them to an Awana club on a Wednesday night and to Sunday school on Sunday morning and think that's discipleship. That's not discipling your family. We're called to, to get our feet ready with the gospel of peace, knowing that we've been set free by Jesus. Praise the Lord. And I'm not trying to give us a bummer and make us feel bad about ourselves. You can do it. I can do it because Christ has made us his ambassadors in light in a dark world. You don't have to be perfect. Just be who God called you to be. Go to, his, go to him in prayer and trust him to empower you. Amen? He'll do it. And when you make a mistake or when you sin, no, you get your feet ready with the gospel of peace. I, I, I don't believe that we should correct our children without telling them the gospel. Does that make sense? You know you lied, and that's wrong. You know, Daddy struggles with lying sometimes, too, because I want people to like me. And so I say things that are untrue, but that destroys trust in relationships. And it's not like the character of God. And he doesn't want us to do that. There's a penalty for that. Jesus paid that penalty for us. He can still discipline us, but he won't punish us in the sense of sending us to hell because he's, he's been gracious to us, but he's creating a kingdom where there won't be any more lying. If you and I are going to be a part of it, we need the grace of God to, to not only forgive us, but to change us. Amen? I would say a, a, a mass majority, I've talked to a lot of college kids, and I would say that a lot of them see no relevance to Christianity. And it's because we have not told them the gospel. The gospel is the most relevant message there is. So we need to get our feet ready with the gospel of peace. The second thing we need to put on the helmet of salvation, I put those together because you can see the common, the common theme there. Just this is what I'd like to say. Salvation is deliverance from danger or suffering. To save is to deliver or protect. The word carries the idea of victory, health, or preservation. Uh, preservation. Sometimes the Bible uses the word saved or salvation to refer to something temporal. Physical deliverance, such as Paul's deliverance from prison. I'm reading from Got Questions, the, the website, gotquestions.org. More often, the word salvation concerns an internal spiritual deliverance. When Paul told the Filipino, uh, uh, Philippian jailer what he must do to be saved, he was referring to the jailer's eternal destiny. Jesus equated being saved with the entering the kingdom of God. And I want to I clarify this so you'll see this. Is this won't be on the screen up there. This is something as I was praying them this morning I wanted to lay out for us. And the, the praise team can come. I'm almost ready to, to, to go to the, our last song about it is well with my soul. But, but I want us to see these things scripturally. If we're going to get ready for spiritual battle, do you know you're saved? Do you know if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done. If you don't, you can be sure by giving your life to Christ. Amen? And there's room in your connection card to mark that. Ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior for the first time. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. But recommit yourself to the gospel. Remind yourself of the gospel. See, and I'm going to start reminding myself who I am in Jesus. And I'm going to look for opportunities to share that with other people. And that's the third thing. Maybe you need to share with those near you, what God has done. Or maybe the Lord is leading you to something different. We'd love to hear about that and pray for you. We have been saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we saw in this very letter, he said we've been saved by grace through faith. Salvation is something that happened in the past for the Christian it's something that is happening in the present. 
We are being saved. Philippians 2 tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is both God, God who both works and wills in us. In Philippians, he says, not that I've already obtained it. One thing I do, I, I press forward, press on. I, I have been saved. I'm being saved, and I will be saved. In 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5.8, he says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope, the hope of salvation. I have been saved. The day I asked Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior, I'm being saved. He's carrying us and helping us overcome those temptations. And when we sin, we confess, and his forgiveness is there for us, and we're moving forward. And I will be saved. There's coming a day where there will be no more death or no more dying. My sin will be totally gone. Your sin will be totally gone. We'll live in perfect peace with one another. Let's remind ourselves of that. Now let's have our feet readied with the gospel of peace. Let's put on the helmet of salvation. I hope you know you're loved by God. I hope you experience that love. It's not just words. I hope you know that if you know Jesus, you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I hope you know there's a call on your life to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and to share the gospel with the lost. Let's stand.